this lesson, we have changed it a lot, hopefully to the better. We have simplified the exercises. If you had this link open since last week, please, uh, please reload it uh, because we have changed so many things yesterday. So I reload the page and I will navigate right into, into motivation. And I like how, oh, let me zoom in here. I like how Enrico uh, emphasized that the, the problem that many of many know, and this is also the core problem of this lesson is it works on my machine. Um, and I, I think I would like to take it even a step further for me personally, uh, the problem goes even deeper. And the problem is that it used to work on my machine. So it's not even about sharing the code with others, but it's even sharing the code with myself. So it, I remember it used to work half a year ago, but now it doesn't work anymore. Why not? Um, and we, we will talk about tools, good practices. What are tricks that we can use to make this easier for us? And if we make it easier for us, we will, add, as a nice side effect, we will also make it easier for everybody else. Just taking notes here, but let's, so what's the motivation? Why do we do this even? And um, we had such a nice introduction with, uh, uh, with the conversation with Enrico, but maybe we can start here with, with this uh, PhD comic. Um, Matthias, should we read it out? Yeah, sure. Do you, should I, who, who wants to be the professor here? <laughs> I mean, you are the professor, of course. Okay, not in real life, but now in this, uh, in, for this lesson, I will be the professor and you will be the student. All right. Okay, Matthias, don't worry. You don't have to start your code from scratch. You can reuse the software that the previous person on the project wrote several years ago. Are there instructions for how to use it? Mm -hmm, I doubt it. Okay, is, is the code commented? Not likely. Where are the files? Hmm. Who knows? It's going to be painful, isn't it? Yeah, just a little, just a scratch. Don't worry about it. You will figure it out. <laughs> so that's anecdote number one. Um, maybe some of us will identify with the situation. Uh, we often don't start from a fresh code. We often start with code from that we find somewhere that somebody else has written. And we often we want to use old code with new data, or we want to take the old code and change it to add something to it. And a second scary anecdote, and Richard mentioned it, is that um, here a group of researchers, they, they obtain great results, they submit their work to a journal, there is a review process, now the figures need to be updated and the researchers start working on these revisions and they generate modified figures but now it's now they see inconsistencies with old figures but now it's difficult to find some of the old data some of the original scripts uh, it's we don't remember anymore which parameters and now we can't reproduce this thing and the manuscript is still in a drawer so that's another episode another anecdote that some of us will identify with and the reproducibility crisis uh, that has been mentioned has been also identified uh, in this study from so the studies from 2016 it's my feeling is that it didn't get better since so this is still relevant so what do and, the, the hmm? figures actually show so they show uh, the, the difficulty of reproducing experiment in different disciplines, so but not only have, some... People have failed to reproduce an experiment uh, mm -hmm. quite a lot. I, I was amused to find out that in chemistry, it's kind of in the lead. We both have a chemistry background, right? Yes. Yeah. I can see that. that this is, I, I'm, I think this is maybe experimental chemistry. I'm not sure it's much better in computational chemistry where we come from. So this is definitely still relevant. And what is also interesting about this graph, it's not only other people's results, it's also 
or like my own results. Yeah. All right. Um, so it's it's more about code. Last week we talked about code. We talked about Git, and now we know how to keep track of versions of our code. We can we can communicate these. So I can I can over the telephone. I can give you the hash of my version or a tag, and you will know precisely which version I'm talking about. But there is more because there is also data, and then there is environment because we have dependencies and operating system. Can you elaborate shortly what is an environment here? It, in in very shortly, it would be like everything else on my computer, because it's because the code that I'm running often depends on my like libraries on the operating system, or I'm using I'm using so-called libraries written by other people. Very often, programs are not self-contained; they import functionality from somewhere else. So that's the environment. Yeah, and people can create their own environments for some code and other environments for other code, right? Right, and we will learn how to how to do that in a in a nice reusable way for different languages. Yeah. And I also like this summary overview that we reuse here. So this is Heidi Seibold's slide. And, and this is really what the lesson is about. How, what are helpful steps to do reproducible research? So number four, version control that we talked about it last week. Today we will talk about here, number one, how to organize files and folders. Good naming for functions that will be later this week. Documentation tomorrow. Uh, number five, stabilizing computing environment and software. That's what that's what we just asked, and we will have today a session on that. And also later today, about where do we publish it? Even where do we publish the code? How do we make it citable? What license? What are licenses? Why do we need to? Why do? Why do we need to talk about them? So this is a very very nice overview. And we can what we can do is I will copy paste these two questions into the collaborative document. Now I don't want to mess up the numbering. I will put it, well, sorry that I mess up the numbering a little bit, but the, I will put it just under question number eight. So it is, it is here, these two questions. And here you can share what are your experiences, rerunning or adjusting a script or a figure you created a few months ago. And have you ever been in a situation where you work, where you continue from a previous student PhD postdoc script, code, plot, or notebook? And what were the biggest challenges? Share your experiences, do it constructively. So here it's not about criticizing anybody else. It's about sharing the tools and tricks. And I can pause for a moment. We will very soon move over to how <clears throat> how do we organize our how can we start organizing our files and folders and directories and scripts. But first, I want to see a bit what what is incoming here. In the second question, it might also mean that you have continued your own script, code, notebook. What were the biggest challenges? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's about it's it's often about docu documentation, about communicating with, and I think for me, the, it, it's really about communicating with humans, much more than communicating with computers. What would you say is the minimal forms of documentation? The minimal thing would be a README. So collect, I mean, I think we will see that in a second, but collecting everything in one place, if possible, yeah. and then having a, have a readme that, that explains. So if, if somebody else finds it, that explains where to start, where are the things, anything not obvious, any traps. Um, yeah, and then of course, in, inside the code, uh, the comments would be 
another thing mm -hmm. which i i think would be also a, like minimal effort of uh, of documentation also it helps you to to develop your code when it's yeah. easy to read from the comments whatever each uh, line or person is doing yeah but maybe we can uh, we will watch these answers thanks for posting them maybe do you want to take the screen and navigate us through the next episode should sure. i keep the, what, what you prefer okay i can do it. And I will watch the document and I will ask you some questions. Yeah. Uh, can you also put this link in, in the um, collaborative document? Oh, yeah, I will update where we are working on it. Just a sec. Try to keep up also with this sub chapters, but uh, it's not maybe always possible, but you can always get to the uh, correct sub chapter uh, if you open this. Uh, toolbar from the left. Uh, but yeah, this is about how to organize your project. So considering the files and folders that you have. And here's a, uh, it's the first step in, in Heidi's nice slide drawing. And uh, here's some quick tips. So have project files in, in one folder, one project in one folder and different project in another folder. And all your projects, they, it's good that you have a consistent directory structure. And also, also it could be informative. So here is an, one example of that kind of directory structure that you can see that here is a source, for example, a source folder, which contains the code. There's a documentation folder. And so it's kind of self-explanatory self already. Then um, there's a <laughs> mention that you should avoid using uh, spaces in any file or folder names. I mean, it might feel uglier for us as humans, but it's easier and handier for computers. So it's going to be easier also for you using the computer. And um, we mentioned this readme file already. So that's like a minimal documentation that every project should have. And uh, when you initialize a repository in GitHub, it kind of asks you that, hey, do you want to make a readme? And we recommend to always do it. And you can always uh, edit and add, in, add into it later when the project develops. And uh, there's a, already a hint that uh, there might be a case that you need to separate some files. So everything you put in GitHub is, is uh, by default, it's a public. You can choose a private repository, but even that is kind of not enough if you have some secrets that would be sensitive data or something. So there's uh, ways you can use git ignore, which is a file that tells git everything that it is or should not be included in the repository. You can al also use a separate folders and, and not put those in, in GitHub. And can I ask um, a question? What if um, yeah. so? What if the data doesn't fit here because it's a lot? Or what if I have a lot of lot of lot of data and it somehow doesn't fit into the same project space? What, yeah, what would you do then? Yeah, it's usually uh, not recommended to put lots of data in in GitHub. Uh, basically, just a short source code. Um, but yeah, that's also good use case for this for this git ignore so here's the mention mention of that so if you have large files or lots of of files uh you can add the the whole folder in in the git ignore file so you can still have it in the same folder where the repository is but the git ignore tells git that ignore those files don't put them in git so that's a handy way um and what i was also after is that if the data is somewhere else because it's too big or because it it's sensitive it doesn't belong here maybe yeah. so at least we can then link to where it is where to find it maybe we can have a small example data which where we can test the code on uh, before i i use the real data which maybe is residing somewhere else yeah definitely and with sensitive data it's uh, always 
um, good to use some, for example, a service for that. At least I know at CSC we have a sensitive data services, but I don't know about other uh, computing centers. Yeah, there's yeah. typically one in, so there's one in Norway, or I believe also in, in other countries. Yeah, how about publications? So uh, here we have a, uh, some a list of tools that we can use to do reproducible publications. And the and, um, point here is also that some of these have a Git integration, so you can have version control on, on that too. And uh, just to mention Overleaf uh, that you can uh, produce with LaTeX uh, documents and it's also collaborative. So it's an online and your uh, colleagues can uh, collaborate on the same document. And uh, this author, is, it was new for me, but I added the link here. So go and check. And uh, then HackMD, which is the similar that we are using. So HDoc is, is basically the same, same functionality. So you can do coll collaborative editing. And that HackMD also has the Git integration if you want to uh, have version control on that. And uh, maybe you can mention some about these uh, other tools here. Yeah, so Jupyter Notebooks, we will see, we will talk more about it tomorrow. Yeah. Also Binder, we will briefly mention today, but we will we will experiment with it tomorrow. It's a very nice service to share, share notebooks and more. So these two tools will be will be the focus of uh, of a lesson tomorrow. Yeah, and this one is for R. If if you're using R, then it's good to know there's tools also compatible with that and uh, i think jupyter notebooks is it all also compatible with r definitely yeah. although for in 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 the r world um there is also the r studio r markdown as a as an yeah. alternative to to jupyter notebooks yeah uh, so yeah we're having can have another discussion on on these topics so i'm gonna i have already pasted them so they are in the in the collaborative document at the end Three questions. Yeah, let's and, see what. And there. The questions are about um, so what tools are you using? Um, are you are you using version control for academic papers? Maybe we should have asked more openly here. Um, how do you how do you handle collaborative issues? For instance, conflicts, conflicting changes, and what tools are you using when you organize your projects and i'm sure there are tools that we we don't even know about and that we didn't mention it would be fun to see yeah definitely yeah yeah this is uh... Um, collaborative issues, for example, conflicting changes. It's it's like a, a twofold thing. I mean, version control is like a, another ver an another solution. But of course, if you are using this uh, real time collaborative document, you kind of never have these uh, conflicting changes. Or or of course, if uh, your colleague just erases your well thought five line last line so that's maybe a conflicting change but <laughs> that's a good point i mean with these real time documents you cannot really have conflicts but you also cannot you cannot easily work a little bit on the side until you are sure that this is the change you wanted yeah in other words it's a bit more difficult to go back without also backtracking everybody else's changes. And that is easier with Git. With Git, we can, we can really control this. So it's also choosing the right tool for the, for the right use case. Great point. Yeah. We, we already see now that there is not one tool that is good for everything and every use case. Yeah. It, it's good to know about the toolbox and then choose the right thing.
also I like the answer that it's about communicating. Communication is key. So to abo avoid avoid issues, we can have all the tools and the technology is here. I mean, the future has arrived, but um, but it's about communicating. Yeah, if you are using Git in in your project and and you invite other people to collaborate with you and if you don't tell that you're using Git and that sort of things, you don't even start the collaboration then. <laughs> so uh, our key points from this chapter would be that an organized project directory helps with reproducibility. It's kind of obvious when you think of it, but it's a question of having taking time and effort to actually do it nicely and reproducibility makes work easier for the next person who's working on the project and that might be you in in a few years so you put it nicely that we should uh we should make projects that are easy to reproduce for ourselves so that's also going to be easier for others but in a summary should we move on to and talk about dependencies Definitely. I so will take the screen. What is a, what is a dependency? Uh, I know that this is not good. Adjusting screen. Um, so first of all, how how can everybody find it? I'm now navigating to the next episode here, but you will also in a moment find it on bottom of the collaborative document. So recording dependencies, and it's about again, it's about communicating different versions. And here it's not just our code evolving. So version control is maybe not enough, but we it's also dependencies evolving. And what are the dependencies? I like to, I always like kitchen analogies. I, I love everything around kitchen, cooking, baking. So I will try to answer this question with a kitchen analogy. I think of software as like a cooking recipe. And here is an image of a cooking recipe in an unfamiliar language. This is how I often feel when looking at software. Um, here data are ingredients and the recipe is my code with instructions on what to do. And at the end, hopefully nice meal comes out of it. Yeah. But when we cook in the kitchen, I mean, I'm not inventing everything every single time I'm reusing recipes written by, by other people. And in this cozy kitchen, it's these cookbooks the, on the table. So yeah. the cookbooks are open or I looking at cook blog posts and, and then I reuse recipes from other people and then I modify them or I combine them. And these, we can think of them as a libraries. So these are the dependencies. So often our code or cooking recipe has dependencies on, on other cookbooks. And in the software world, these are libraries, packages, um plugins and how do we version control those like how do i communicate to you what dependencies i'm using in my code and there are tools that there are many tools that that w try to solve this problem and we list a couple of them this is not the whole list so there's conda and and Anaconda and PIP and virtual environments, PIP and poetry, requirements.x, environment.yaml, rnf, many others. So here are only Python and, and R, but there, there, there are similar solutions for many other programming languages. Matthias, are any of these tools that you are using? So I'm not using all of them. I'm using only part of them. But which one are you using? Yeah, at least Conda, because uh, it's easy with the code refinery uh, installation instructions. At least I found them easy. Um, and then I've used Anaconda because that was also easy to start with because you could um, you could just go to the web page and, and download it if you are unfamiliar with the terminal. So. I've been using that also. And uh, what, why, what is the use case? Like, why do you, why do you use it? Uh, well, 
to be honest, when I first downloaded Anaconda, I had no idea. And then I find that, okay, it also installs Python and some nice packages. So then I thought that, okay, it's probably about the packages and I, mm-hmm. it's the like one-stop download and I can have all those stuff here on my computer. Yeah, so that's, it's about, so some of these tools can be used to actually install packages onto my computer. Now in the context of reusability, reproducibility, what these tools also do is that they can record, they can, they have a way to uh, tell me which are the versions that of the packages that I'm using right now. And we will see that in a moment. So we are now not very far away from an exercise. So the team leads can already warm up. We will we will start an exercise soon, but we first want to still explain a bit what the what the big picture here is. Um, so one thing if that I, the, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. If there's a more than one project and they have a different versions of pandas that they have been using, or or different sets of libraries that they need. So would would I then use some of those tools? Great, great point. And this is also what they these tools are shining at. It's they make it possible to isolate environments. Because often I cannot use the same environment for all my projects. Maybe I have two projects and they have different dependencies, and the, maybe the dependencies are conflicting, and then I can isolate it. So what I personally like to do, I like to create an environment for each project separately. It's a bit like, I mean, when doing this back to the kitchen analogy, I don't use the same cookbooks for all of my cooking projects. And here I can isolate them nicely and I can document them separately. Yeah. Basically, I'm currently, I'm only doing like small coding projects, uh, mainly myself. So it's, a, I'm using only the co- code refinery conda environment so would you say i should consider some other workflow i think i would recommend to um to create a separate environment for each project Mm -hmm. because if you use one environment for all the projects after a while if if you then want to if you then want to run your project somewhere else then then the question comes up well what are the dependencies because we need to install dependencies somewhere else yeah i and would then, say that the point how do you know that when you should move uh forward from the one environment is when you need to install a new package so if you don't need to install any uh, additional packages to the environment that you have then of course the environment works mm-hmm. But if you need a new package and install it, then you need to have the environment and you might need the same environment later, but it's yeah. good to have a separate environment. Yeah. What I also like about separate environments is that if I make a mistake and I will make mistakes, I can delete it and recreate it. Yeah. So I prefer these isolated environments rather than installing everything into my computer because that may be more difficult to undo. Yeah. Should we introduce the exercises? Yeah, sure. Uh, so our plan is we will do a 20 minute exercise, but first let me explain what, what you can do there. You can, uh, you can work as individuals, you can work in teams, you can pick your journey because we, we write different in different programming languages. We are not all here Python developers or R developers. We have two exercises there and you can, I recommend that you start with the the one that is called dependencies one, but then you can also move on to to the one called dependencies two. Uh, you can also find a solution. So if you're interested, you can, but let's not spoil it yet. And here in exercise one, uh, the situation is that we open a time capsule. So we we travel three years into the future and we find github repositories of five students who wrote a code which has dependencies on on libraries like and in python world they are often 
people depend on SciPy, NumPy, etc. But now we now we are three years in the future. We find the GitHub repositories, but the five different students have documented their dependencies differently. And now the, what you can work on is which of these do you will really, do you expect easiest to rerun and why and discuss what problems you anticipate in each of these solutions and then you can you can choose whether you want to do this exercise in the conda world or if you if you work in python watch environments here's a version if you work in r then there is another version Unfortunately, there is nothing here because I don't have experience with MATLAB, but if you do, maybe you can contribute an example. It would be nice to have more languages here and more, uh, more scenario. And then, we'll, so you can spend 10-ish minutes on this, and then you can move on to dependencies too. And here, you can try to create a time capsule for the future. And again, choose your favorite environment. And if you don't have one yet, if you don't have a, your own project, then then take the code refinery conda environment and try to create this time ca time capsule, which is which is a file. Create this file, study it, um, and discuss what is the advantage of this. Um, and and I mean, one advantage is that once you have this dependencies documented, you can later recreate them yourself or somewhere else or somebody else. Yeah, so is the exercise uh, until? So the exercise would be then we would work for 20 minutes until 10 minutes past the hour. Yeah. Then, and then we will together start the break. So I want to let's meet them for one minute so that I want to really separate exercise from break. Yeah. So exercise until 10 past, start with dependencies one, pick your track here and then move on to this dependencies two and let's meet again 10 minutes past the hour. All right, good luck and see you then, bye. Yeah. Okay, welcome back everybody from exercise. Before I send you into the break, I want to tell you one or two sentences. We have seen that many questions about Conda. Um, the goal of this exercise, because we threw you a bit into the cold water, we didn't, we didn't explain um, all the con different Conda commands, but that was not the goal. So the goal here was not that we become experts in conda or watch environment or rnf our goal was that we create sensitivity for that you know that it's possible it's a good idea to write down dependencies somewhere already the readme will help but there are tools that do this in a standard way and now whether you should choose conda or python watch environments or rnf or something else really depends. Um, if you are unsure and if if all of this is completely new and you have never seen any of these tools, then perhaps start with Conda. Conda is maybe the more more general here because it's applicable to many languages. Python virtual environments that's really only for Python. R and is for R. So our goal was that you you know it's possible. You have heard about the tools, now you can go and explore these tools and make your future self a present and document your dependencies. And we will now send you into a break. Uh, everybody, let's take 10 minutes break. We will be back 22 minutes past the hour and then we will talk about computational steps. So 22 past the hour, take a break. See you in a bit. Bye. And welcome back, everybody. Um, thanks for so many questions about Conda. For me, that's already an outcome. 
asking you these questions and asking asking yourself. So when you later go through the corridor, ask your colleagues what are the de your dependencies, and if they look uncomfortable, you know what are the dependencies? What did I do again? Then then you can uh, now you can tell them a couple of tools that can help. I will. We will now take it. Uh, look at the different aspects of reproducibility. So I will go to a different episode. We will put put the link at the bottom of this document, and we go into the episode run off right after recording computational steps. Also, here our goal is that we, with Matthias, we'll create a bit of context. We show you an example. We we want to see what is the problem, and you will get then then a chance to to practice and to discuss and again so in a bit we will do another 20 minute exercise block but let us first let us first set the stage so what is this about it's about the situation that in computations often it's not only one step it's not only reading input computing something the hack MD, maybe Richard, you can change. Oh. What is it? In the stream. Uh, it's front of on screen. The, the, the preview thing isn't correct sometimes. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Nice. All right. Yeah. Yeah. There. Good. Okay. But thanks for, thanks for uh, being attentive here. So it's sometimes difficult for us to know what exactly we are sharing because we we also have many screens to watch here. So thanks for <laughs> thanks for that. We are now looking at recording computational steps because often it's more than one step. It's not only reading input, compute something, and we are done, but it's multiple steps. One example that we will look at together is um, here. We try to keep it really simple. We have two steps. So we in this example we will we will take a book. It's a it's a it's a book in the public domain. We have a code that will go through the whole book and collect which are the ten most common words. And this is an English book, so there will be the of and to a. And then in a second step, it it produces a a, a bar plot of these uh, occurrences. So this is just an example project, and we uh, are taking into taking a look into this uh, from the computational steps point of view, right? Yes. Yeah. So here we don't need to understand how this is done. We don't need to know Python. It's implemented in Python, but that's not the point. The point is here we have more than one step. We can imagine that each step takes a long time. And let's imagine that in the real life, we have more than two steps. We could have five steps. And in this example, I will open up the GitHub repository if you want to have a look. And you can, you can also clone it to your computer. Because in, later in the exercise, we, we encourage you to clone this project. Just taking one one note that I need to specify later but let's let's have a look what is in there if you follow this link you land at a github should I maybe switch to the color scheme maybe I will switch to the color scheme I forgot to do that appearance I think it's easier to read if it's light on if it's light background so let's do that again with light background it's a repository there is some data in there and now we have four books so these are books these text files let's i will open one of these so there is it's a public domain book from the project gutenberg and of for these four books we want to produce this this can be done in two steps so the first step if you want to try it out, it uh, it reads the book and produces this statistics. 
and in the second step we generate a plot. But now what if we have more steps and what if that it takes a long time and what if we have more than four books? Imagine we have 500 books to process. So is any of you in this situation and how do you address this? Um, and maybe I can again go to my popular kitchen analogy is that what we will show here is one nice way to solve this problem is using workflow management systems. And here we, we take advantage that our computer, it's, it looks like a busy kitchen. So there are many chefs and they could be the different processors, the different cores. And we have different tasks to do. So in a busy restaurant, it's not like one chef does everything, but the different chefs do different subtasks. One is one is peeling potatoes and another one is creating the sauces and another one is creating the desserts. Right. And the person who who is working on the dessert doesn't have to wait for the person who peels the potatoes. They can work in parallel. And the, these workflow tools, they help us not only organize this work so that we, we can get it done in a really efficient way, but also they help us to communicate the steps. So they will, we can, again, we can communicate what are the steps we need to do in which order to the next person. So if there's a project with five different scripts, and it's not your project, you don't know which script to run first. So then these tools, workflow tools come to aid, right? That's right. And if, I, if you look at our project here, it's also not very clear because the, okay, there are some data and then if you look inside, there are some Python scripts, but it's not so clear here, what should I do now? What should I do first? How to even run them? It would have been nice if we added here to the, at least to the readme on how does it work? What are the steps? Now it turns out that there is a file here that communicates this in a nice way, but we will come to that in a moment. So this is one of the many ways to, to communicate the steps for future generations. But it is not clear here for somebody visiting this GitHub repository. Yeah. So at, at the minimum, we should have written here, well, look at the snake file and then it will become clearer. So let, let us explain what this exercise is about. Uh, the, the preparation, the exercise preparation that you can do now or then during the exercise, you will have enough time, is that if you want to try it out on your own computer, then please clone this example repository to your computer. This will require that you have you have the code refinery conda environment installed and that you can activate it. If you if this didn't work and you don't have it installed or you were not here the last week or you didn't go through any install instructions, please still go through the exercise. You it, in my opinion, it's you can go through the whole exercise even without doing anything on your terminal by reading, thinking, this, discussing in, inside the collaborative document. What you can also try is to run this example on, on something called Binder, where you can run this on a cloud service. Here we will not explain much more about what Binder is. We will, we will explain this a little bit more tomorrow when we talk about Jupyter Notebooks, because that's, that's where the Binder really shines. But if so, you're curious, yeah. you can try it as well. Hmm? Yeah, so let's say if you're new to code and um, don't have the Conda environment or just want to explore, I assume you can just uh, click this uh, link, go to github.com code for a word count and launch Binder in, in the batch. Is yeah. it that easy, really? It's the thing. It will now take, it will take, uh, maybe a minute or two because it needs to install the environment and guess what 
what is it that it uses? It's the one that we already uh, discovered in the last episode. Nice. So now we, 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 here we communicate the dependencies to, and Binder is reading them, using them, and sets up an environment for us. This is now running not on my computer, this is somewhere. And here you can go into the terminal. And you can also, hopefully, uh, run the exercise in here. You can try it out. So these are, this is the exercise preparation. And now exercise again, we will have 20 minutes, but let us first explain. There are two parts. There is workflow one, workflow two. The workflow one is solving this, this question of how do we not only automate, but how do we communicate the steps to the future generations in, in first in a script as a script. So this is a bash script. And here we have, a, we are iterating over the four books and we are doing these two steps and you can try to run it. So do I need to copy that script from there or is it there already? Uh, you need to copy it. It's not there. We, I did not add it to the repository. So you, you would need, you would need to, you would need to copy paste this into your, in you would you would need to create a file inside the repository folder that you clone. Yes. Yes. Or in binder. Yeah. In either on so either on binder or in your in your computer it would be in the same repository as the project. Yeah. Then you can try to run it, but actually the, the point here is not, not the running. The point is to think what, what are the advantages of doing it like this? Yeah. And to, is this reproducible? And of course, there is some, some answers. You can find a solution. And then imagine we go from four books to many books, and this now takes two seconds. But what if it took half a day? So yeah. what, what problems do you anticipate? That's that's the goal of this part of the exercise. And I would say if you are new to coding, uh, that's already quite something that you figure out and think through the the part one. Yeah. So not a problem if you don't have time for part two, but if you have time for part two, now you can look at this mysterious file called snake file. And and also here, this file is, it's, uh, it's plotted here. The, the difference between this snake make, which is one, a tool to orchestrate running these steps. The difference be between snake make and the scripted is that the script says uh, for each book, first do this, then do this. The, the difference that is snake make, we don't really see immediately, like what should we do first, what should we do then? Instead, we express what are the dependencies. Here we say that if I want to have some statistics, then I depend on the input to it are books and the counting script. And if I want to have plots, then it, the input to plots, I will need to have the statistics and I will need to have a plotting script. And if I want to get everything done, then I would like to have all the plots and I would like to have all the statistics done. And now we tell SnakeMake, this is what I want. I don't tell you in which order, but you figure it out. And SnakeMake is really good at also finding out which of these can be, can I run independently? which of them I need to do first and do then. So like in the kitchen analogy, if I, if I work on the main course, I need to wait for the person who chops the, the onions. And uh, SnakeMake is really good at that. SnakeMake is not the only tool that does it. Later down in the episode, we list other tools that have the same, same approach. And in this exercise, your goals would be Clone, clone this ex example, study the snake file. Can you make any sense of it? But then 
try to run it. And you can run it with a command called snakemake. And you will see that it will, well, first, first you need to, because the results are already there, we need to first delete all the results. And then you want to, you will see that you can hopefully produce all the statistics, all the plots with this one command. And then when you run the command again, you will notice that whew, it doesn't rerun everything again because it's somehow understood that everything is done. And then you can try to make a make a tiny modification to the plot script. Maybe add a space, add an empty line if you've never seen a Python script. So you don't need to write Python, create an empty line and then run snakemake again. And what you will see is that it will not redo everything it will only redo the plotting That's and then try to make a tiny modification to one of the books and you will see that it will not redo all the books it will just redo the data for this one book and then we will have an aha effect and this is of course very nice and discuss the possible advantages if you if you are an R developer you can th think, how would I adapt the snake file if I wanted to have that not in Python, but in R? So try these things out. Again, here is then a possible one possible solution to this. And then if you're interested below, and maybe we will have time later, we can discuss what is so nice about snake make, what are similar tools. But maybe we can do that once we are back from the exercise. I just want to make sure that the exercise is really, really clear before we send you there. What did I forget, Matthias? Any questions? There is a question number 56. I missed some of the preparation steps. Could someone repeat it? Maybe you can write it in the HackMD, these preparation steps you said. Yeah. Okay. But they're also on top here. So the preparation step is uh, essentially it's this clone the repository to your computer and activate the code refinery conda environment. These are the two preparation steps. Also here you may you may maybe feel well we have we have to use snake make we didn't introduce it. The point is not become experts of snake make it's the, my point here is that you can see the what is a possible advantage of workflow management tools compared to scripts which doesn't mean that scripts are bad scripts are great they are reproducible and they are really good enough for many occasions but here we want to see when when is a situation that i want to have maybe more than a script Are we ready for exercise time? I think we are ready. We will give you 20 minutes, which means that we will meet again one minute after the hour. We will then summarize together. And then after the summary, uh, we will do a, a, another break. So exercise 20 minutes, workflow one and or workflow two until one minute past the hour. Have fun, ask questions, and see you then. Bye. Yeah. And welcome back, everybody, from break. We wanted to summarize a bit this episode and some lessons learned. Also, we wanted to really focus on what was the point of this and what are the lessons learned? We also see that there were technical issues um, by getting the Conda environment activated, but hopefully we can focus on the, on the, on the learning points here. Yeah, in this example, the second one was about using SnakeMake and SnakeMake is just the one example of these tools. So was there any specific reason why we, or any good, points in snake make why did we choose that as an example good question so why why did we why did we choose snake make and further down here we list similar tools so we could have demonstrated the same 
with make, nextflow, task, common workflow language. So these are workflow tools. Many exist. Or take the one that is popular in your academic discipline. So Snakemake is very popular in bioinformatics, but not only there because it's it's just what the community likes. But it's it, it's really Snakemake itself doesn't mind in which discipline is used. What is the why did we show workflow management tools with the example of Snakemake? We we had to choose one for the sake of time. There are a couple of really nice things about it that are hard to do with scripting alone. One, one thing that we didn't show is that it's possible to run on multiple processors. If you have many tasks that are independent, these tools make it easy to parallelize. Another really nice thing that we didn't focus too much on is it's possible to give, sometimes you have different steps that require a different environment. And we could have done that. So I could have given this step a different environment than this step if I wanted to. And what is so nice about these workflow tools is that if we connect it back to where we started today, the anecdote about the paper being in, in review process coming back and now we need to modify some figures. If this, if we get it now, the referee report, we need to modify the figures a little bit. Now we know what to do. All I need to do here is I modify this plot script. And then I run the workflow. And the beautiful thing is it will not even, I don't even have to regenerate the statistics. It will, I only need to regenerate the figures. And I don't have to be very careful about what to what to regenerate and what not to regenerate because the tool will know uh, and do it for me. There is this joke that everybody everybody during the PhD everybody will invent their own workflow language. Definitely. <laughs> so, but you can you can also avoid inventing your own and have a look at the many dozens available and pick the one that you like best. The ideas are similar and our goal is always here reproducibility. So we not only automate, but we we have documented what we did. Good. We have now 10 to 15 minutes left in this lesson before we move on to our different lesson. And now what do we do with the remaining 10 to 15 minutes? We wanted to tell you that there is an episode that we will not go through, but I think it's it's nice to read. And I think the only thing I want to show here is the is the is the meme which we really like. So this episode that we will not do is about containers and back to the it works on my machine. And sometimes the solution is to okay, well uh, we just send you. I shall send you my machine. And so uh, that's a container. And if you, if, if, okay, one last time, kitchen anal analogies. So it would be like, I have this cake recipe that always really works in my kitchen, but somehow when you try to do it, it doesn't work. But then I just send you the entire kitchen here. Build the kitchen, it will be exactly like mine, and then it will work. And the this episode talks about what containers are, the pros and cons. It doesn't guarantee reproducibility. There is an exercise further down where you can discuss a container recipe in the context of reproducibility. So it's possible to make mistakes. And I think it's a fun episode to read later or on a rainy day. But we will skip it today. We will we will move to the last episode. So the container is like between the environment and and a computer so it you can run it uh on different os and and it should work exactly so like my my computer is a linux so the kitchen yeah. looks like this and then i can send you a container image that that will be that will mimic my computer and it will be a file so i can send you my computer inside a file 
and then maybe I don't know what operating system you are using, but then you can you can run it inside that file, and it will the code will think it's inside a Linux computer. Yeah. Nice. But let's let's move on here. We want to answer one 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 more question, which is an important question. Yeah, so this uh, computational steps and these environments have been so far uh, handling the, the part where you develop your code. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now moving from that onward, where you want to share the code, maybe share the results and papers. Yeah. Right? Right. So now the project is completed. What do we do? Do I keep it on my hard drive? No, we, we want to have a, we want to put it somewhere so that so that we can find it again, other key people can find it again. And so it's about fair principles. It's about making things findable and accessible. And one last week, we, we learned how to push, push our code and to GitHub. And now our example here is on GitHub. But is that enough? Mm -hmm. Is it enough to put things on GitHub and then move on to my next project or not? What is the problem? And, and I can answer it and say that it's really good to put things somewhere, but it's actually not enough to make things findable and accessible because in a week later I could remove it or I delete my account or maybe GitHub doesn't exist in five years, who knows? So what you want to really do at, at the end of the project is to make it really persistent and findable. And there are many nice services where you can deposit your code, data, scripts, workflows, containers, um, and not only make them persistent, so they will live there for 10 years, 20 years, but also make them citable. They will get you will get a digital object identifier which will so a link which will not break and one thing we can try now if we feel like it we could try to show you one of these services so more of them are listed here on the page but one one very popular service is another it's a it's an open service that started and operated by CERN, which will live for the lifetime of CERN, CERN the, mm -hmm. the particle accelerator place, um, which is very popular for depositing data, but also software. And if you like, we could try it on one of your projects, Matthias. Yeah. And what we will basically do is that there is this exercise, but we will not do it as an exercise. We will demonstrate it, but we will follow these steps. And then if you want to then later try it, um, try it on your own project, then you can follow these steps. Before you take the screen, one thing I want to point out is that what we will now do together, we will use this sandbox. So there is a sandbox, a, pra a place where we can practice this. And once you, once this works, then you can use the real service. And the reason for this is that we don't want to create a persistent archive now for a practice run of ours. We want to first, once we want, because whatever we create on the real zenodo.org cannot easily be deleted because that's the whole point of findability and accessibility. So we will now practice with the sandbox. Yeah. So please take the screen for me when, whenever you're yep. ready, and then we can try that with one of your projects. Okay. So should I first? Do I actually need to use this link at all? Because this also asks about login. Yeah, I think you can maybe go there straight to point two. But well, the point is we go to the sandbox. We need to log in somehow with your Orkit or GitHub account. Let's take GitHub account. We need to give it certain permissions, but all the all Zenodo really wants to, it will watch your public repositories, and it will. We need we will now later enable it for a certain repository, and then it will watch. 
for when there is a new release for the repository. That's all it does. Yeah. So you are now on the sandbox. Yes, you are on top. On top it says sandbox.zenodo.org. Great. So here, the good thing is we can't destroy anything here. And if we make mistakes, it's not a big deal. And now what now? Which project should we try it on? Yeah, so no, do I need to go to the GitHub or in Zenodo find the repository? So in Zenodo, it will now list all your repositories. OK. Uh, if you go on the, I think there, the arrow, and then GitHub here. Nice. Now you see lots of repositories. And let's let's pick one that, that yeah. we would like to show that on. There's yeah, a that's... question in HackMD. Are we supposed to follow along or just watch? Just watch. Yeah. So watch us, watch us do that. You, we will follow the instructions, then test it out later on your on your site. Here, the best best experience is only watch. Yeah. So here's my uh, project, which is actually uh, part of my master's thesis. So that would be ready for publishing. Great. So it's nice that we preserve it and for future generations. We, uh, we, what we did here, you flipped from off to on. What that means is that from now on, Zenodo is watching that repository. Yeah. And whenever we create a new release there, it will then Zenodo will do something and we will see what that something is. Okay. So here's so nine instructions for this. Oh yeah, that's it. There, there is. Yeah. So flip the switch, we did it. Number yeah. two, create a release. So let's do that. And that we do on the GitHub side. So this so, is now the repository mm -hmm. of my project. Mm -hmm. And where do you get a new release now? You can, so a little bit to the right, it says releases, currently none, but you can create a new one. And now you can give it a title, it could be like, I don't know, version 1.0 or 0 0.9, or I personally like, yeah, something like this. There could be a description. So if this is a, if this is a code, it's sometimes nice to summarize here. Yeah. What what is the big picture of changes from last version to this version? Yeah. Um, what once we once we click on the green button, it creates a release. Under the hood, it's a Git tag. So for those who remember Git tags from last week, we're actually creating a tag here. Okay. So you can. All good to go. Yeah. Let's go. Oh, did, it, did we do that already? Uh, I, oh. did not, I did not choose a tag in from here. Oh, yeah. Like so here we need to, I would say, I would use a small v uh, 1.0 in one word. That's, yeah. Yeah. Something like this. Good. And now publish release. Yeah. It will create a tag from now, from master. So now we have a release here. But now, if we go back to Zenodo, something should be happening there. Aha, uh -huh. so it's enabled. And if you click on it, oh, there. Do we... Now something's happening. And what is happening here is that we see received. There is something happening since 17 seconds ago. And what Zenodo sandbox is doing here, it's creating a digital object identifier for us. So we could come back to here to this in a couple of minutes. Yep. And that would be a DOI that we can then cite and it will always redirect to to this place. So we're waiting for for some time. We could wait for some time. And but let's remember this is a sandbox. So then if people try it out and then they get a DOI mm -hmm. and then they take it to doi.org and try to find their record, then that might not work, but this is a sandbox. So yes. this is this is to see how the mechanism works, but then you can go to the real Zenodo.org and it works exactly the same way. So it wasn't too much work to set it up. And now every time, every time you create a new release mm -hmm. for your project, every time you will get a new DOI automatically. A new one? Yes. So it means that uh, if I use the, for example, this 1.0, in um, let's say an article and, and I refer to that DOI and then I 
create new release and in some other article one to refer to the new version so those are now different ones yeah but you can have them different if you want to but you can also zenodo will also give you a doi that will always refer to your latest if this yeah. is your preference so then if you depends how what projects prefer if they want to be cited by version or always the latest one okay nice so citability and findability and accessibility and again this is one of many services but it's maybe the most popular yeah Awesome. I'm now thinking whether we are ready to change context and go into software licensing. I would say so. Maybe the, I don't see any change in this page. I refreshed. So maybe it takes some time. Yeah, this will take, take some time. Oh. Good. So we, we will now conclude reproducible research le lesson. We, we are ready to go to social coding licensing. For all the team leads, you can now relax. They will, we will not do individual or group exercises. All the exercising, all the discussion from now on will happen in the collaborative document. Yeah. Would you like to take the screen? Yes. Let me do that. Um, here we are. Oh, sorry, need to readjust this. And now, how do I find the social coding lesson? Ooh, you can, I can find it on bottom of the document. It's not there yet. It's gonna be. social coding no, it's so this is the link that you now is there so you can find it on bottom of this collaborative document we will now go into this lesson and spend the remaining actually less than one hour on that but it's fine we will focus on the essence